Um, our, first, our first speaker this afternoon is a colleague of mine, Dr. Erica McAllister, who is a senior curator for flies and fleas at the Natural History Museum. And her interests are quite broad, <laughs> <laughs> and they include the taxonomy of flies and flea, fleas, and she's involved in mosquito projects, which have included looking at viruses that are vectored by mosquitoes, and, she's, um, and also at looking at genomic evolution. As well as her commitments to fleas and flies, she's also very heavily involved in public communication of science, both within the museum and also externally. She's participated in um, is things that I've never been asked to do, which is really annoying. Night lives, nature lives, night safaris, and children and adult dinosaurs. I bet you didn't know they had adult dinosaurs at the Natural History Museum. <laughs> she has presented a Radio 4 series on insects entitled Who's the Pest? as well as appearing in many other both television and radio programs. And she's recently published a popular science book entitled The Secret Life of Flies, which is full of everything you wanted or didn't want to know about flies. But Erica will talk to us about field work. And I'm a bit worried about this because I've been in the field with Erica. <laughs> Hello. Um, so um, when I was asked to give this talk, and I was like, uh, well, tell me about your experience as a female in the field. And I thought, well, actually, I only know what it's like being a female in the field. So this confused me to start with. And then I thought about lots of topics that I realized I could not talk to anyone about, because there's all the things that go wrong, which we, we, we talk about in the pop, but it's totally not appropriate for the lay in society. But then I thought I would, I would bring some of the silly stories and some of the reasons why we do field work. So when actually thinking about it and, and trying to figure out were there differences between males in the field and females in the field, there may have been previously, but I'd like to say I think there's very few now. Apart from the obvious public perception of what we all look like in the field. And as someone who does a lot of tropical field work, this is just ridiculous outfits, unless they've managed to find the one place on the planet where there's no mosquitoes, which as the person who goes around the planet trying to find mosquitoes, I'm quite amazed by that. So the skimpy clothing, the, the males looking all butch and fantastic, and no offense to many of the male field biologists, I've rarely come across this. It has to be said. Um, I like the way they've always got the nerdy one, which is odd, because if you ever do field biology, they're all the nerdy ones. <laughs> there is no separation with that one. So what, in reality, do we really look like? A little less glam. Now. I tried to get a really like cool one of me with my machete, and I just look beraggled. I I'd just been kind of walking through the jungle. A group of students were just about to turn up. We'd we'd done the thing that stu uh, supervised do. We got lost on our first day. We came out of the jungle looking like idiots, slightly feral, and all the students are like, "You're going to be looking after us for a month," and they were asking our machetes, going, "Of course." Now, to be fair, buying machetes is still one of the best things you could possibly do in field work when you go into a shop and like, I'd like six machetes, please, and that's great. Um, but one of the things they don't tell you when you go home and, you, and everyone's like, God, what were you doing? Cutting up snakes and whatever. And I'm like, no, actually, I'm cutting up plants. Because plants harbor some of the worst things you could possibly have, and that is caterpillars. So actually, I'm more worried about deadly caterpillars in the rainforest than I am about jaguars. We don't look so glamorous when we're doing our field work. Um, I just can get myself covered in muck from the moment I start. This isn't just muck. I am an entomologist, and we use various baits. And um, that's a little bit of bait smeared on me. I'm not going to tell you what the bait is, but it was personal to me. <laughs> So, and obviously, we, we drive around like idiots stopping at the side of the road when some botanist says, get out of the car now, and we have to go and hoover a plant. So we're not exactly what they look like. So this brings me on to what we used to dress like traditionally. This arguably is the grandmother of uh, field biology, of entomology. This is an amazing German. And I sit there and I moan about what it's like to do field work. The first time this woman did field work, she was 52, okay? She was 52 and she went to Suriname. She went to Suriname at 52 300 years ago. We moan about the facilities, we moan about permits, we moan about getting on a plane. Do you know how long it would have taken her? And she took her daughter. 
I can't imagine taking anything worse than your own relative <laughs> into the field. So it's like what this woman did. And she was fantastic. And we are still using her work today. The value of her field work is immense. She was the first one to document life histories of these uh, Lepidoptera, the butterflies and moths, and the first one to talk about host plants. So she's an amazing woman. I, on the other hand, I didn't have to worry about so much. Probably the toilet facilities were the same then as they were here. But as a young 21-year-old, my first experience of doing field work uh, outside of the UK was to fly to Australia. It was a kind of a break or a make move. I'd never been on a plane before. <laughs> I had never encountered dangerous animals. And yes, the Australians were like that. Uh, but it was an amazing experience to go in the outback and do that. But one of the first things as a female that I get asked about doing field work is the uh, toilet facilities. Pretty much straight away you realize there's none. Or if you're unlucky like me and you're a female and you go to a country where they're very proud to have you as a scientist and a bit freaked out that you're a female, they offer you the worst toilets on the planet. I can honestly say I've been around the world and used the worst toilets, and my worst experience was in Tajikistan, where I swear the female toilet was last used when the Soviets ran the country. And I can tell you this because the tissue paper, or sorry, the newspaper beside the toilet was from that era. Now, there was no lights, which is probably just as well, but it may have made a really good sampling habitat for me. But most of the time, we don't worry about that, and we, we go au naturel. Other things we have. Historically, females themselves weren't allowed to do much of the work. We're weak, we're feeble, we're quite pathetic, and we had to rely on field assistants to do most of this for us. Now, this, this caused a lot of issues because um, anyone, if you're a field biologist, you want to get in yourself. You want to get there and you want to know it, you want to play with these specimens, you want to go and rip and tear and maim and have fun in the field. But going back to Eleanor, uh, she was an entomologist, um, an English entomologist who did amazing work looking at pest insects in the UK. But I love the fact that when she wrote her, her book talking about it, the, the rural community would have debates about whether to help her, to see whether her work was feasible enough, whether she was doing something valuable. I wonder how many men had their work queried in this way. But she eventually got these people to help, and it's fantastic and it's something I still utilize today by taking loads of students with me because deep down I am quite lazy and I like doing the fun stuff and I might as well get them to do all the, the hard stuff. But this in itself, there's challenges in the field, trying to coordinate, I don't know how many of you have done this, trying to coordinate your research effort and encouraging the next generation to go on. Every time I take a group of students, and it's a, generally a mixed group of students, to 12-year-olds when I have to persuade them to put a net over their head and let the spiders fall down into their hair always causes a little bit of problems. Give me half an hour and then that's it. They are putting their nets over their head. They're like, when can we kill? I'm like, we should maybe not use the word kill. We are, we are euthanizing for science. This is all research. Yes, but when can we kill? Okay. And I send them back round to their parents and teachers across the world hoping that I'm not going to be sued, or the museum is going to be sued. <laughs> Another very inspirational lady when it comes to doing field work, when it comes to her impact in science, Mary Anning. Although not an entomologist, I still have a lot of well, enormous amount of respect for this woman and what she did. And I love reading the stories about how she did all the crazy field work. She was just throwing herself up and down the cliffs in the worst of weather. I didn't do anything. In the worst of weather, she was doing all of that. She was excavating some amazing finds. And her inspiration, her knowledge, is still so valid today. She was um, very badly shunned by the male community, the male research science community at the time. A lot of her work was taken off her. She was never accredited for it. And basically, the only male, I believe, that she really liked was her dog, Trey. So, which is fine. I understand that. But I like to think about now is actually us females in the field, us females in science, do not have to face the same barriers that she does. I do not have to justify myself being a female to do my research anywhere. There are still definitely ceilings we need to break, 
But there are things that actually we're very good at as a sex, and one of those is communicating that I can use a lot to my advantage in the field. So in Indonesia, I'm traveling around with a group. I obviously don't speak Indonesian. I'm having to rely a lot on weird communication. And I wanted this man's cow shed to go collect mosquitoes from, and he was like, who's this crazy woman? I'm like, yeah, I know I'm crazy, but I still want your cow shed. And annoyingly, we discovered there's a really good way of communi communicating with field work, and I do this with every bit of field work I go on, actually, is I bring up the language of football. Now, football has annoyingly got me in more places than anywhere else. I bring up Man United. I haven't got a clue who's playing for Man United. I can mention a few names, and suddenly I'm let in. And that starts me off, and then I'm back down. And it's amazing. And he let me go and sample in his cow shed. And I have to say, this is one of the few times that I really did question whether I wanted to be in science. Because it was 11 o'clock at night. I was very tired. I've got a big hoover. And there I am in his cow shed. And annoyingly for me, there's a very big bull in it. He's tethered. But this bull has got very amorous ideas about me. I'm tired. I'm trying to hoover a mosquitoes off a ball. It's trying to be friends with me. And that was the one point I thought, maybe, maybe this isn't for me. But luckily, I carried on. Um, Evelyn Cheeseman, she is, she is um, one of the most amazing women out. Um, Evelyn Cheeseman, she um, so, suffered from an age that still didn't let her into uh, a lot of societies uh, doing what she wanted. She wanted to become a vet. Um, luckily for us, she got turned down. She went away, the war happened, First World War, and she came back and she was the first uh, female hired at London Zoo, and she ran the insect house. And from there on in, history is done. She was an amazing woman. She encouraged everyone to bring her new insects in. She worked with the community to show them what was going on. She did all sorts of things. And then she got the travel bug. And she explored everywhere. She was amazing. She went to the South Pacific so many times in all those areas. She brought back over 70,000 specimens. One of them is this one up here. And this is um, it's, um, Alphidre. Anyone know an Alphidre? No. It's a shore fly. They're fantastic flies. So she brought back not even the subject she was very interested in, which was beetles and butterflies. She collected everything. So she really did understand the spirit of field collecting. And we have loads in our collection, the Natural History Museum and the fly collection, of flies that she's brought back that have now been described after her. And one of the big buzzes, I still have to admit this, is that when you bring back stuff and you see it go off and you see it get described, you see it get named, and you see it be brought back, and you know its value in the collection now and in the future. So her specimens, all the specimens that have been caught in the last 300 years still have a purpose. And we are all adding to that as field biologists. And we haven't really changed in, our, in fact. So what she was quite funky at is that these trousers she made herself. She made them out of male sap because she realized that going around in skirts wasn't that good. Now, we were talking about this, and actually there are some advantages of doing field work in skirts. If you, any of you have ever been to Bolivia, and have you seen how the women uh, micturate? There is a, a massive advantage, is that you can have layers of skirts, and all you do is sap. And then you've got a nice little delicate toilet area covered with you. But she realized that actually climbing through the jungle wasn't necessarily that good with skirts. So she made her trousers out of male sacks. And all, basically, our outfits today haven't changed since. I spend a lot of time as an entomologist in a DIY shop, or what used to be Woolworths, 99p shops, you name it, I love them. And um, it's taught me, and very much the era of Blue Peter, where I can grab a few items and I can make the most amazing field equipment from. So this is the, one of the good things in the field. Um, I've just recently come back from sampling in the Caribbean, and um, I wanted to make a uh, fly extraction device from dung pats. So it's amazing what I found around the camp, and this is one thing we have to do as biologists. 
This Hymenopterus, she obviously didn't catch that in her trap, but she is lucky that she just goes out with bowls of water. We can do such amazing science with the most basic of tools. So what is it actually like being in the field? Never go into a room that an entomologist has stayed in. We use these tiny, tiny little micro pins, okay? And these have an amazing ability of migrating all around the room. I've often sat on the tube and gone, oop, and removed one from my bra, much to the horror of the other travelers. But we basically, we, we seem to go into a room and then we just empty all of our equipment. It's just like we, we just throw everything everywhere. And our personal stuff is generally at a level of chaos, but our field equipment is the most properly looked after. Because what we're most concerned about in the field, number one is samples, number two is specimens, and number three is the other people. And it is always that order. So we travel around our, our luggage every time we go through customs. I'm always stopped. I open it up. They look at it. They close it. And they just send me away. They are not interested in all the crazy stuff that I have. And my cat tried to steal in that one, which was like, bless him. Life on the road is never glamorous. All these lovely things where you see them in uh, National Geographic and they're all like, wow, we're here, and we're doing all of this. No. Um, Peru with Sandy, our petrol stations were people's rooms that they'd stuck a petrol tank in. Some woman hid petrol under her bed that we had to buy petrol. Yeah, we were a little bit concerned about that one. We're, we're forever getting stuck in traffic jams. It's a nightmare trying to get around them. Um, food, this is the back of the trailer. That's where we're making sandwiches. Um, I have eaten more, more inappropriate foods than most people um, because they're all over my hands. My PhD was on a wetland center covered with geese. I, I ate probably very inappropriate food for several years doing that. And then, as you know, we stop for a coffee. And obviously, you get served a coffee in a jug like that. So the food is not that glamorous. The roads. The, the roads themselves are, can be quite dangerous. This, I, I tried to estimate. I think this was about 4,000 meters up a mountain, four of us in a big vehicle, uh, one male, three females. The one male was getting really upset. The three females were giggling. This could be it. We could be dead. Um, so it really does depend on that. To be fair, it was quite horrific. And I think our nerves were all definitely there. The wildlife isn't always what you expect it to be. Um, I, you know, I do sample in some of the most exotic habitats on the planet. But then this was Hounslow Zoo which has to be said wasn't that exotic. And here I am with my hoover, suctioning and sampling a pig. So that wasn't totally glamorous, it has to be said. But there are all sorts of things. Now, I know one of you in the room knows what this is. This is a scolopendra. This is a centipede. Or, and it's one of the few things, as an entomologist, I will run away. Um, and we do a lot of field work with students, and whenever we do it with students, there's two rules, no nakedness and no swearing. Now, thanks to this creature, one man on a field trip once broke both those rules in a millisecond. <laughs> As it had climbed into his sleeping bag at night, he hadn't realized, he got in, it bit him on his toe, he got out naked, and started running around swearing quite a lot. I got the email, and I was very disappointed because A, there was no photos of the centipede, not him. And B, there was no centipede. He obviously had it in a really secure environment. And I think that's poor sampling. <laughs> but so we have this wildlife. Now, sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's not. I have a unique ability to attract in snakes. I don't know how many of you know. Me, my little 21-year-old, when I first went to Australia, obviously, I'm used to the UK. And I know the myth about Australia being venomous, and it's true. But I went running up to this first one, which is the brown snake, when all the Australians lost it and said, Erica, get into the car now, but with a little bit more anger. And what they do is they curl up under the uh, axle of the car, and so when you open the door, they attack you. So I was like, oh, that's nice. This one is a Cape Cobra. And I was in uh, Kirstenbosch, which is their equivalent in South Africa of Kew Gardens. 
and I had my head in a net, and I looked down, and I thought, that's very odd. My feet are wiggling. Why are my feet? Oh, that's not my feet. Oh, it's a Cape Cobra. And then my first thought was, I can't die here. It's like dying in Kew Gardens. If I get bitten, I'm going to have to run into the wilderness. Not run for help, run into the wilderness. And the third one is a tercio pelo or a third lance. And this is in Costa Rica. This is my favorite one because they, um, all the people studying the snakes couldn't see these. Me as the entomologist running around with gay abandon them trying to find flies, trod on it. It reared up into my face. I went, who? And then it just went off. And I, it was obviously, you could see it go, it's an entomologist. What do they know? And not only do you have that, you're getting bitten all the time. Is it a terrible, like, um, and this is my um, colleague's legs. Ha ha. That's why you don't wear shorts. Um, we wear leech socks because the leeches cause pandemonium. And believe me, they really do. We fall over. I've got the best bruises. What they do is before I go away on field work, they draw an outline of me and mark where I'm going to get injured. And then obviously mosquitoes. And the lovely thing about mosquitoes, you not only can get mosquitoes, you can get malaria. You can also get a bot fly which is always fun, but I'm yet to have one, which is annoying. The diet is weird. I don't know what these are to this day, but I do believe you can grow bacteria on them. Chicken feet was bleh, bleh. But it brings me to why we do it. And uh, in the last couple of minutes, so Margaret Fontaine, she was a fantastic woman, again, a lepidopterist. First, one of the first people to be allowed into the Linnaean Society. Finally, a fantastic female going around the world. And she did go around the world. She went absolutely everywhere and mad for it. And it's brilliant. And she did all these fantastic drawings. She did all that and her specimens, why it's so useful. Because I go around the world. I go to the jungle. I bring back specimens. This is a stalk-eyed fly. We only had two in the collection before. One was from 1917. One was from 1970. So, you know, going there, I'm adding to science. I'm going to Jizistan. This is me being very serious. But we're looking at which uh, mosquitoes are transmitting uh, malaria for the country. So we're helping aid. We're giving our research back and forward. I'm going into, this is a poor quality. I'm, I'm, I'm hoovering up. I'm cleaning up the countryside for you lot. Hoovering up mosquitoes, OK? And we're describing new species. So this was a, a new species we described out there. Not only are we are looking at the mosquitoes, we're actually describing the viruses they're transmitting. So on public health, we're doing a fantastic thing. I'm um, going around latri latrine pits in Indonesia. Honestly, my mum is so proud of some of my field work. But here we are figuring out why was this one species of mosquito transmitting malaria and one wasn't. Well, actually, when we went back to the country, we found it wasn't one, it was four. So this is why we still need to carry on doing research. We still need to go out there and do our field work. And then just for describing species, this is me in the Caribbean. It was a terrible time. Months in the Caribbean, but in the field work out there, I've, we know that we've got 12 new species of housefly. These are just houseflies. Imagine when we start looking at everything else. So the field work is very good. I thoroughly love it. And in, in, in say it's rewarding, and say it's fascinating, and in saying what's the difference between males and females, I'd say very little, less than 24 hours when females stop worrying about where they go to the toilet. That is the difference. And then, oops. The, the good thing I would say is, what was it? Um, Evelyn Cheeseman said that we, we carry on, we do our work, and the thing is we never retire. So the whole thing about us doing this, us doing our field work, us collecting, is that the specimens don't retire, and neither do we. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erica.